Howdy, fellow soldierners, and welcome back to Appropriating the Culture, your favorite TCC teaching course on culture and the appropriating of it. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching, you magnificent b As you can tell by the unnecessary censorship, today's episode is a continuation of last week's examination of language, particularly bad language, with a view on the evolution of amoral to immoral words and the use of language in the arts. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your censor today as we appropriate some culture. Let's review. Last week we mentioned that the Bible has quite a bit to say about our speech, but most of these verses are talking about what we say, not how we say it. It's not really dealing with the particular words that we use. It's not primarily about profanity or cuss words or swear words. Exactly. However, but there are scriptures that do seem to be concerned with the particular words that we use. Precisely. So as Christians, we ought to be set apart from the world, certainly in terms of what we say, but also in terms of how we say it. Our speech should be different. But aside from taking the Lord's name in vain, depending on how you interpret that, there's not an objective standard for what are or aren't bad words because language is cultural, and the culture decides which words fall into which column, and it varies from place to place, and it changes over time. Thanks, Pastor Shane. <laughs> what a guy. Yes, language is cultural. The culture dictates which words are bad and which words are fine. And because it's cultural, it's not uniform or objective. It varies by culture, like we saw last week when we compared the profane words of, say, Australian English with American English. There are differences. And language changes and evolves, and so we looked at a few examples to see how bad words transition to innocuous words over time. Now, that doesn't mean that as Christians we rush into the latest language trends. There's nothing wrong with being conservative in our speech. Actually, it's preferable. But there is an issue when we start to extend our language standard to others and be offended and judge one another, especially non-Christians, because their speech is a shade or two or four bluer. We can be prudent without being prudish, trademark. My wife uh, has her master's in marriage and family therapy, and in part of the training they had to spout and listen to all kinds of foul language in class because as a therapist you're going to hear all kinds of things. And if you wince or flinch or clutch your pearls or faint, you have disqualified yourself from being their therapist, especially if you faint. That's no coming back from that. And I think the same is true when it comes to our Christian witness when we live in. We don't have to speak like the world, but we do need to listen if we're going to make a difference. But we can't do that if we regard sin as external and can't handle some salty language, and especially when we can't handle the salty language that our culture is desalinating. We can be prudent without being prudish. Trademark. There should be even more grace when we're dealing with cultural issues. Words change. Some words are bad, they become innocuous, and it works the other way too. Innocuous words can become bad words. When words change, they take on new meaning, and they are ascribed a place in the pile. In fact, some of our most offensive words in modern society were totally fine just a dozen or so decades ago. And that's really fascinating when it comes to the arts. Most Christians, I think, believe that movies, television, and music have coarsened because the entertainment industry has no qualms about offensive speech. But that's not entirely true. Amy Pascal, the former head of Sony Pictures, said this, how about the next time when any of us are reading a script and it says words like f or f take a pencil and just cross it out. Just don't do it. We can do better and we will do better. We have to. <laughs> Hollywood prudes, am I right? There is consideration to language. They're not concerned about the S word or D word or the traditional F word. No, it's the new F word. That's the problem. That's offensive speech. That's filthy language. That's unwholesome talk. And Christians ought not to use those words. But Amy Pascal was saying something more. She was talking about scripts. So not only can you not say those words, no character should ever say those words. And we see this issue playing out even with classical literature. To Kill a Mockingbird and The Adventure of Huckleberry Finn have been pulled from school libraries for the use of the N-word, and new editions of Huck Finn have edited out the N-word. What do we think about this? Is it an offensive word? Yes, it is. Should Christians use this word? No, they should not. Should authors and artists be allowed to use this word? Yeah, I think so. 
You know, I, I love To Kill a Mockingbird. It's the first book I ever read in school that I reread on my own during summer break, no less. And the notion that students are being deprived of because it uses a word that's totally appropriate for the context is irritating. Exposure is not sin. It's not what comes in. And isn't it shallow thinking to completely ignore the theme and the message and the point of the story and reject it because you're offended that some characters use some bad language in a way that accurately reflects the way those people talk? But here I've laid a trap. Because that is how Christians often think of art, where they completely ignore the theme and the message and the point of the story and reject it because they're offended that some characters use some bad language in a way that accurately reflects the way those people talk. It's the same thing, it's just different words that we're offended by. And our Christian production houses are just like Amy Pascal. Not only can you not use those words, your characters can't use them either. But do we need to use those words? Well, certainly not for every story, but it can limit the kinds of stories that we can tell. Or let's put it this way. Is Huckleberry Finn a story that needs to use the N-word? I guess you can edit it out, but it is set in the 1800s and takes place in much of the South, so that seems kind of dumb. And by the same token, if you're telling a story about a gangbanger who eventually comes to Christ, is it necessary that he uses profanity? I guess you can edit it out, but he's a gang member. So if he has a cleaner mouth than my grandmother, that seems kind of dumb. And the bigger issue with this is if we can't accurately portray the world, then why would anyone believe that we have the correct worldview? Sanitizing the present is really not much better than the modern efforts of trying to sanitize the past. And this is increasingly important because those who ban words will next ban books because books are nothing but words, which is happening. As is indicated by our sponsor today, Appropriating the Culture is brought to you by Fahrenheit 451, not the book, the temperature at which books burn. Crank me up to 451, hand me your offensive tomes, and I'll handle the rest. Catcher in the Rye, more like Catcher in the Buy. Mein Kampf, more like No One's Kampf. 1984, more like 451. The Witch, the Gargoyle, and the Perfectly Perfect Man, more like Hey, don't burn my book. Actually, you'd have to buy my book to burn it, so... Get your kindling on Amazon, because we're having a fire sale. Fahrenheit 451, making problematic materials go poof since at least Jehoiakim. Christians have been guilty of this too. Christians have wanted to ban books for a whole host of reasons, including the language used. And we really ought to be champions of free speech because it affords us our right to preach the gospel. Now, it's true that the First Amendment is about the government and not private entities per se, but it's more than that because free speech is also a value. And if we don't value it, it will go away. Hate speech legislation already exists in other democratic countries, and many are pressing for it here. That's scary because the gospel is offensive to people. You may not use swear words, but sticking to the Bible's claims about homosexual behavior is just as bad in our culture, if not worse. That's hate speech. That's unwholesome talk. That's filthy language. Norway recently expanded their hate speech laws to such an extent that even talking negatively about transgender issues in private could lead to a year in prison, three years if it's done in public. Christianity has always been offensive because the truth is often hard to hear. Even Jesus, who was perfect, offended the sensibilities of many people in his culture by what he said and did. So the charge for us as Christians is not to eliminate all offensive speech, but to refrain from meaninglessly offensive speech. What we say and how we say it should always be filled with grace and truth. As it says in Titus, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. Or as it says in Peter, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Truth, but with grace. And the same should be applied to our art. Let's be truthful, but gracious in order to transform our culture. And that's imperative. That's the whole point of why I'm doing this course. We need to intentionally and deliberately go after our culture because the book banners and book burners are coming. 
And there's plenty of language in the Bible that our culture is going to find offensive. Well, that's all for now. Leave me your gracious and truth-filled comments or questions on my author's Facebook page, my Twitter page, or locales. And if we haven't been censored, I'll see you next week on Appropriating the Culture.